I don't think anyone can articulate the way the internet has imploded upon the surprise return of Half-Life. It's not what a lot of people may have wanted or expected, but it happened. The first Half-Life game in 12 years is a prequel, and it's in virtual reality. Granted, this had been rumored for a long time after various leads on a proper continuation died out, but I still don't think anyone expected Valve to drop this on us after their lack of communication regarding not just Half-Life, but also everything they were once vocal about. They funneled their focus into Steam, Dota, VR, brain interfacing. Half-Life fans were left without closure until the writer had to post something on his blog during retirement. Major Team Fortress 2 updates were becoming increasingly scarce, and at this point, any possible future update will most likely be the last. Any leaks on their future titles were starting to run dry, and all hope seemed to have been lost for what was once a legendary name in the industry. That is, except for one name that seemed to persist throughout the initial leaks and rumors that took the place of actual communication from Valve. HLVR. These were leaks that seemed the most prominent when foreshadowing the future of the company. From what I could gather, this was going to be how Valve both reintroduced the world to Half-Life and revolutionized virtual reality in one fell swoop. This seemed far more likely to exist than any proper follow-up to the Half-Life series, but no one could really tell what was going to happen with Valve's streak of silence, crypticness, and, well, Artifact's existence. Then, when their virtual reality headset was announced, they also revealed that a flagship VR title would be coming later that year, in Valve time. The stars were beginning to align, but a part of me genuinely thought it was too good to be true, especially coming out of Valve. And yet, it was all true. HLVR was the flagship game, and it was just recently revealed to the world as Half-Life Alex. There I am, sitting in a loud and claustrophobic McDonald's when I get a notification on my phone from the Valve News Network Discord server. When I read the tweet, I was in shock for a few seconds. This was Valve's official Twitter account, verified and everything, it wasn't April 1st, and this was really happening. As soon as I had processed that this was a real tweet, I was shaking. I sent the necessary DMs to my friends, and I called my brother to let him know that Half-Life was back. I was happy, confused, angry, intrigued, but most of all, I wanted to see more. This fabled VR game needed to be more than what anyone could expect from VR in the modern day. This needed to legitimize VR as a medium for delivering games on Half-Life's scope. Three days later, we received the trailer and a release window of March 2020. In Valve time. There is a lot to think about here, but my overall first impression of Half-Life Alex is astoundingly positive. I bought the game four minutes after the trailer went live. Honestly, it baffles me that VR games haven't tackled a fully-fledged, single-player, narrative-driven shooter before. Games like this have usually included VR as an option, rather than building the game around VR. Boneworks was the first VR game I've seen to take advantage of both a robust physics engine and advanced VR concepts whilst being narratively driven. It combines a multitude of approaches to combat and puzzle solving with a mysterious Portal-esque approach to storytelling. But outside of Boneworks, I haven't seen anything like this in VR. Perhaps it's due to a lack of resources for these dev teams, but it really hasn't been attempted at all. They're either experimental or very focused arcade-like experiences. There's nothing wrong with any of this, of course. That's what makes VR so unique and fun to play around with in the first place. But the lack of a more robust experience is what had me excited about the prospect of a Half-Life game in VR. It's in Valve's nature to only release major Half-Life games when they have advancements in game design and tech that they'd like to showcase, and that notion fits Half-Life Alex's existence like a glove. Half-Life 1 showed us how a video game could uniquely tell a story. Half-Life 2 showed us what an intricate physics engine could add to a video game. Half-Life Alex aims to show us how virtual reality gameplay concepts can revolutionize not just the first-person shooter, but game design as a whole. The first few seconds of this trailer are immediately captivating. Not just because of that high fidelity head crab, and also because it's been 12 years since we've seen new Half-Life content, but also because none of this appears to be scripted. We hear a head crab, and the actions that follow are carried out by the player for the trailer specifically. Peeking around a corner to get a view of the head crab and pushing a bucket aside, those are all motions the player can perform if they want to take the stealthy approach. Hypothetically, I assume you could just rush in there and shoot with your eyes closed if you really wanted to. As a matter of fact, none of this trailer appears to take control away from the player. 
just like a Half-Life game should avoid doing. In every shot, no matter how smooth or beautifully framed it may be, it is always in real time. You can tell based on the slight swaying in each shot that it's somebody slowly panning with their head. This is par for the course when it comes to Half-Life though. The only instances in Half-Life 2 where control was completely stripped away from you were in the G-Man speeches and in the stalker pods. But you could at the very least look around in those pods and examine the Citadel. That looks to be the case here too, with the only segment not featuring that head shake being the final scene as the G-Man walks towards the screen. In both of the original games, this allowed for the player to react to situations however they liked. They could choose not to listen to characters and instead play with the toys located around Kleiner's lab for example. Not giving the player the opportunity to do so in this game would have been a huge missed opportunity, especially with the new medium at play here. Knowing Valve, I'm sure they wouldn't miss a beat. This isn't the only thing to make it feel like a Half-Life game in VR though. Half-Life 2's claim to fame was conditioning you to its physics engine without you even being conscious of its existence. Throwing a can at a CP officer, the way the airboat bounces as you speed through water hazard, the arc of your SMG's grenades, puzzles where you weigh down a seesaw with cement blocks, all simple things that are expected of a functioning physics system implemented both explicitly and subtly. I've noticed based on this trailer that Source 2 has a far more advanced and realistic physics engine than Source's modified version of Havoc, and it's about time. I can only imagine how we'll be able to play around with it in the full release. Certain scenes in this trailer imply the unconscious and seamless nature of the physics engine. For example, when a Combine soldier is storming the room they're in, the player scrambles to find a special type of ammo that can take them down in one shot. They sift through the shelf next to them in order to find them hiding in the back. And even then they have to reload it and aim it at the soldier before he ambushes them. It's a short clip, but it's a poignant representation of how organically the physics engine can be interacted with in order to find resources and solve situations. But it goes further than that pushing a hanging Combine soldier out of the way, zombies throwing debris at you while you're stationary in order to deter you from staying in one spot. Yeah, this is a Half-Life game alright. Another example I love is, much like Half-Life 2, the physics engine is used to script interactions between the characters. You're gonna need a gun! Don't worry, it's unloaded. It's unloaded now! Beyond the physics though, VR's two-handed control scheme will allow for some pretty awesome ways of approaching combat. Healing with one hand and shooting in the other, disorienting an enemy by launching an object at them with one gravity glove and finishing them off by shooting them with the gun in your other hand, checking your health in the heat of the moment by looking at one hand while throwing a grenade in the other to keep enemies away. That last one's just an example based on what I can gather from a two minute trailer. I can't wait to see how the game will have us juggling things in both hands, especially with the gravity gloves on our side. This game has to be a lot of fun to play, and the trailer does an incredible job conveying this. I'm also quite happy Valve is making this game accessible to as many people as possible. Although they have gone on record by saying this game plays best with Valve's own Knuckles controllers, and I don't doubt that seeing as they were designed in conjunction with the game, Half-Life Alex is playable with any Steam VR compatible headset. You'll be just fine if you have a Vive, Oculus, or Windows Mixed Reality headset. It also supports various playstyles, so if you can only experience VR sitting down or in a small space, Valve has you covered. From what I've heard, the game was designed around teleportation-based movement, and I'm curious to see how the other movement types will affect the game, but it's nice that you have options. The same goes for how you interact with the game, either finger tracking or trigger-based controls. Valve wants as many people to be able to play this game as possible, and alongside that, they'll be releasing the Source 2 SDK alongside the game. Finally, people will have new tools to play around with. A new version of Hammer. Modders rejoice. Certainly, people will attempt to make this game playable without a VR headset, but I'd imagine barely any of the actual experience will be properly translated. I personally can't wait to see the boom in player-made mods and unique stories set within the Half-Life universe. Playable in VR. Or even with traditional controls like the good old days? I love Minerva, I love research and development. Imagine what Source 2 would have to offer for these developers. I'm not trying to discredit VR by the way, I'm just saying that a lot of opportunities have opened up for these mod developers. Assuming it allows for traditional controls. Anyway, by all accounts, this game is shaping up to be incredible. It's something that VR needs. It's a leap beyond everything we've seen and played thus far in the medium. It's looking to make a similar impact to Half-Life 1 and 2. But... What is a Half-Life game without its narrative at this point? We've discussed how the narrative could be presented, but what about the story itself? It's set between Half-Life 1 and 2, so there's only so much they can do, right? Well, not exactly. 
Although the game seems to primarily focus on the Resistance's fight against the Combine before Gordon Freeman's return, the dialogue at the end seems to imply events beyond this time period will be showcased and dealt with. You will not save him. Alex Vance alone cannot prevent his fate. Close your eyes, honey! The Vortigaunts imply that they know what will happen to Eli in Episode 2, and they mention that Alex alone won't be enough to prevent it. Of course, this could just mean she's initiating the hunt for Gordon, right? Obviously, a lot of unanswered questions will remain until we all get our hands on the game next year. Will the game only be providing context for these events, or perhaps something more? Much like the G-Man appears to be able to travel through time and space, the Vortigaunts can too. They are in a constant struggle to keep the G-Man away from Gordon and Alex. But as far as we know, they aren't trying to manipulate time and prevent certain actions from occurring. Paradoxes and whatnot. Of course, Gordon's removal from Zen and subsequent stasis are simply the G-Man's means of readying him for when the world needs him most. He may be pulling the strings somehow, but he hasn't used excessive force aside from that instance with Gordon. What transpired during his removal was the result of the Combine, and the G-Man simply wants to see how well Gordon will perform. I don't mean to jump to conclusions and assume time travel will be involved, or that we'll even learn more about the G-Man, because the alternative to all that is seeing how Alex will take action after learning her father will die. Both are exciting prospects, and no matter what, the game will shed some light on mysteries that have persisted throughout the Half-Life universe. Yet, they can only take so many steps forward. Although this game will build upon Episode 2's ending, I doubt it aims to resolve it. That's a problem that only a proper continuation can resolve. And even now, I doubt we'll ever receive that. Regardless of what does and doesn't happen, I want you to remember what brought us together today. Our love of Half-Life is one thing, of course, but the other reason this is such huge news is Valve had left people in the dark on the future of the series for over 12 years. All we've had to tide us over are leaks and cryptic comments in interviews. And yet despite everything, Valve isn't giving the world closure. They've brought Half-Life back, but in the form of a VR prequel. Those that are upset about the series taking a step back in time are justified. Those that are upset that the series is aiming to make strides in VR instead of finishing the Half-Life story are justified in their complaints as well. Hell, part of the reason I made a video on Half-Life in the first place was because my repressed emotions from waiting 12 years were brought to the surface. Even after this announcement, there's still a taste of bitterness in the air surrounding Half-Life. Our actual closure is coming in the form of a fan game that's adapting a blog post from the series' retired writer. Although Valve may be teasing the possibility of making a Half-Life 3 someday depending on Alex's success, I highly doubt this will come to fruition. Valve is funneling their focus into VR. They're leaving the past behind and moving forward. Half-Life Alex isn't the only game they're working on for the medium. And it's nice they're making games again. But if you expect them to be traditional and like the Valve you once knew, well, I'm sorry, but that isn't going to be the case for the foreseeable future, if at all. I, for one, am willing to embrace this as Valve's Silver Age. But there are still a few loose ends that remain untied. Team Fortress 2 being abandoned, and Half-Life still lacking any closure. I don't doubt that they'll build upon Episode 2's ending in this game as we discussed, but I'm not sure if it will drive the story forward. It's gotten to the point where Valve was willing to license the Source Engine out to the Boreal Aleph team, who are making a direct adaptation of Mark Laidlaw's Epistle 3. To me, this is confirmation that they would rather leave the series in the hands of anyone who wants to conclude it. One of the most popular comments on my Half-Life video, if not THE most popular, is a story about this person's experience with their grandfather, and how the two of them played through the series together. The two of them waited for years for Episode 3, and as of today? Nothing. What hurt the most was this last sentence. My grandfather died waiting for episode 3, and we all probably will too. I can't imagine how they must be feeling now that Half-Life Alex has been revealed. It's certainly a Half-Life game and it looks great, but it's far from being closure. And no matter what these coy Valve employees might imply, they aren't going to take a step back from what they see as forward thinking for the sake of the Half-Life story. They haven't until now, and I don't think they will in the future either especially considering they've admitted the project seems too intimidating to tackle. They've tried it, and they abandoned it in favor of moving forward. Thus, the silence they've left us to suffer in still hurts. Bottom line, no matter what happens in the future, we won't forget the decade of silence. Or at least, I won't forget. But, 
I am ready to forgive. Valve's future for the first time in years is looking bright thanks to this game. And it feels so good to say that. Even if this is not the return everyone expected or even wanted, it looks to be an engrossing step back into the Half-Life universe. That's more than I could have expected in the face of modern day Valve. With all that said, I'll see you next year for my Half-Life Alex retrospective. <laughs>